Okay, members. Ready to resume. So, members, the next item on the order paper is a motion on the Internal Market Bill, and I will ask the clerk to read the motion, please. That this assembly recognises that a trade deal between the United Kingdom and the European Union is critical in protecting the interests of everyone living in Northern Ireland, expresses deep concerns about the UK Government's approach to negotiations and the terms of the United Kingdom Internal Market Bill rejects any argument that the bill is necessary to protect the Good Friday Agreement, further rejects unilateral move to undermine the authority of the devolved institutions contained in this bill, affirms its commitment to upholding international law, mandates the First Minister and Deputy First Minister to take a formal position opposing the UK Internal Market Bill, and calls on the Prime Minister to respect the will of the people of Northern Ireland and the principles of devolution. Thank you, and I call Matthew O'Toole to move the motion. So moved, Mr Speaker. Uh, thank you. And the Business Committee has agreed to allow up to one and a half hours for this debate. The proposer of the motion will have ten minutes to propose and ten minutes to wind. All other speakers will have five minutes. Please open the debate on the motion. Thank you, Mr Speaker. As I rise to move this motion, we are reminded again that we are living in the midst of the greatest public health emergency in any of our lifetimes. That, in turn, has caused a profound economic crisis that none of us, none of us yet know how big the proportions will be. We are just 100 days from the end of, a tr of the transition period and a potential further shock to our economy, and that is for no reason other than unbending ideology. So, Mr Speaker, in moving today's motion, let me first reiterate the message from a previous Assembly motion that I moved on Brexit, that the transition period should be extended beyond the end of this year. It is both economically reckless and immoral that the UK Government refuses to do so. But today's motion is about the Internal Market Bill. It firstly makes clear that it is overwhelmingly in the interests of everyone living in Northern Ireland, indeed everyone in these islands, that a trade deal be struck between the UK and EU in the coming weeks. It is unlikely that the deal will be anything more, if a deal is struck, that it will be anything more than the thinnest possible arrangement providing zero tariff and zero quota, zero quota, zero quota trade between the UK and EU. But even that would be better than the extraordinary act of self-harm that no deal would represent. If that were to happen, the UK would have the same trading relationship with the EU as enjoyed by Mauritania or Mongolia. Quite a remarkable position to end up in, given the claims during the referendum campaign, including by some on the benches opposite, that the EU would be rushing to give the UK unparalleled access to the single market. Anyone who thinks that we don't need the protections provided for in the protocol should consider that. If there had been no protocol and the UK had left the transition period without a deal, then trade between businesses in Dundalk and Newry would have taken place on World Trade Organisation rules. In trading terms, the North would have had less access to the market on the rest of this island, not just than Singapore or Canada, but than Madagascar or the Solomon Islands, all of whom enjoy preferential trade partnerships with the EU that go beyond WTO rules. All of this, Mr Speaker, is to state why the protections in the protocol, though imperfect, are essential. That is why the attempt by the UK Government to nullify the provisions in the protocol via the Internal Market Bill are so serious. The last few years have been dizzying in terms of the speed of events and the volume of information and change all of us have had to process. That sense of bewilderment is in many ways one of the most effective tools of the populist, and Boris Johnson is certainly a populist. So let us remember what he himself said about the deal he is now repudiating via the Internal Market Bill. It's oven ready, he said. You just put it in the microwave and there it is. But anyone watching the House of Commons two weeks ago will have seen the Northern Ireland Secretary stand up at the dispatch box and say the, no the UK Government intended to repudiate that bill by undermining it, by breaking the law in narrow and specific ways. Mr Speaker, that is not how international law works. The international rules-based order is not based on individual countries arrogating to themselves the power to break their obligations as and when it suits them. If you don't believe me, then take it from none other than the Brexiteer former Attorney General Geoffrey Cox. We simply cannot approve or endorse a situation in which we go back on our word, given solemnly not only by the British Government, but also by Parliament when we ratified this treaty. Or even that other famous closet pan-nationalist and liberal remainer, Michael Howard. How can we reproach China or Russia or Iran when their conduct falls below internationally accepted standards? Mr Speaker, many Brexiteers and indeed some members opposite have been quick to criticise prominent US politicians, including the Democratic candidate for president, who have warned against the UK breaching its obligations in the withdrawal agreement and, by extension, its obligations in the Good Friday Agreement. Let me say this. Think who is speaking out on this. 
Think about the reputation, and I say this with the greatest respect, think about the reputation of the country you are passionate about remaining part of. The current UK government is fast developing a reputation as an irresponsible actor on the world stage. Mr Speaker, let me move on to some of the specifics and specific problems with this bill. First, it has been claimed loudly that it is about protecting the seamless flow of goods, especially food, from Great Britain into Northern Ireland. That is a quite remarkable claim, since nothing in the bill, as tabled, makes provision for the movement of goods from Britain into Northern Ireland. It all relates on to goods moving the other way. Just another casual lie and misrepresentation from Boris Johnson and his populist government. We want the protocol to operate as seemly as possible, and I cannot state that enough. But that is not what this bill does. It gives UK ministers the power to unilaterally dis disapply certain provisions of the protocol. That would plunge Northern Ireland into legal and administrative chaos. The protocol and its requirements would still exist, and indeed the UK government is claiming uh, that it it intends to uphold the protocol, notwithstanding its specific and narrow breaches, but we would be left in, the invidious, in an extremely invidious position in relation to our access to both EU and UK markets. Mr Speaker, that is not a position any of us should want our economy to get into, especially not in the current circumstances. And I go back to what we've been discussing and debating both in this Assembly today and in the House of Commons in Westminster. Does anyone think that it's acceptable for our economy to be plunged into chaos at the end of this year in the middle of the biggest global health emergency in a century. But there is a further fundamental problem with this bill. It represents a clear undermining of the devolved settlement, not just in Northern Ireland, but across the UK. Part 6 provides UK ministers with sweeping powers to spend money however they please on the full range of devolved competencies. Less than half a page long in the bill, but, fundamental, but in fundamental contravention of the principles undermining devolution. No wonder both Scottish and Welsh devolved administrations have been opposed to it. And let me say, it was the Labour administration in Wales that was opposing this, not a nationalist administration. And yes, it also undermines both the Good Friday Agreement and the Northern Ireland uh, Act, which put, put, the, put the provisions of the Good Friday Agreement into effect. There has been much commentary about what is and is not in the Good Friday Agreement. So let me be clear, hard Brexit and all that goes with it, including this bill, do contravene the agreement in, to use the British government's language, narrow and specific ways. For example, of the dozen specific areas of North-South cooperation mentioned in the agreement, all but a few are either un underpinned by or interact with EU law. Indeed, coordinating the delivery of EU funds is in itself one of the North-South implementation areas specifically mentioned in the agreement. And this bill, as I've said, attacks the devolved competencies provided for in the agreement. Paragraph 3 and 4 of Strand 1 state that, quote, the Assembly, this Assembly, will exercise full legislative and executive authority in respect of those matters currently within the responsibility of the six Northern Ireland government departments and quote that the Assembly operating where appropriate on a cross-community basis will be the prime source of authority and respect of all uh, devolved responsibilities. Clearly, clearly, uh, Mr Speaker, um, part six of the uh, Internal Market Bill is in direct contravention uh, with that. Uh, but more broadly, this bill is another example of the shock to the central nervous system of the relationships and assumptions that underpinned the agreement and remain critical to the functioning of our institutions and the broader set of relationships across these islands. And those relationships uh, are precious to us and to my party and to those who are frustrated and bored by us constantly talking about them in the Assembly in Westminster. Well, we're not going to stop. We aren't going to stop talking about them uh, and we aren't going to stop bringing motions to the floor of the Assembly and we're not going to stop tabling amendments to this bill uh, at, at Westminster. Uh, colleagues aren't there. But I do want to say to Unionist colleagues uncomfortable uh, at the notion of checks in the Irish Sea, I acknowledge those concerns. I particularly acknowledge those concerns coming from members in the Ulster Unionist Party, many of whom sincerely voted Remain. I've said throughout this process the entirety of hard Brexit 
is a shock to the principles underpinning the Good Friday Agreement. But I would ask, given the, given the conduct of the current UK government and the red lines they have set out since 2017, but particularly since Boris Johnson became Prime Minister, what is the alternative? And I would say to them, say to those uh, today considering whether to back this motion, think about whether Boris Johnson is a man to be trusted. Think about how he's lied to you before. Think about whether this bill is really what our economy or our institutions need. Mr Speaker, the UK Government has repeatedly made great claim of respecting the consent of the Northern Ireland Assembly. They even had it written into the withdrawal agreement. Let's make it clear this bill does not have our consent. For obvious reasons, I will not hold my breath on a clear statement of intent for the Executive. But let us be clear that this Assembly rejects the Internal Market Bill, upholds the principles which have underpinned our institutions and affirms that commitments made in peace agreements and international treaties should not be the plaything of demagogues. And I commend this motion to the Assembly. And I call Paul Given. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. And this feels like round two, having debated this issue yesterday. And indeed, the member for South Belfast repeats the same arguments. Uh, and I have no doubt we are going to hear from the benches opposite and the Alliance Party as part of the nationalist movement on this issue the same arguments again. But nevertheless, we will confront them uh, and expose uh, the hypocrisy uh, around the issues that are being raised. Whenever we consider this motion, which we, um, goes without saying, will be objecting to because it is flawed in its content, it talks about the importance of a UK-EU trade deal being critical. And so it is. So it is. But by the 1st of January, three months' time, is that going to be achieved? I think there's a huge question mark over that. So what else can the sovereign government of the United Kingdom do but make preparation in the event of the European Union? continuing to be intransigent, continue to threaten and bully, but to be ready for an eventuality that does not uh, do the harm to its people, or at least mitigates that harm. So the internal market bill goes somewhere. It does not go anywhere near far enough. The government has given assurances that they are going to address further issues in the finance bill with more amendments. But I, I do not trust Boris Johnson to do the right thing for this place, or the Conservative Party, because time and time again they have let the unionist people down. But uh, that will not stop us advocating in the interests of what we believe for all our people and for the unionist perspective in respect of this. What we do need is certainty for our business and consumers, and that, that is something that is absent. The withdrawal agreement and the protocol hands the leverage to the European Union for them to use us as a pawn in a much bigger play thing. Do members really think that Michel Barnier and those that are leading the European institutions really care about Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland? Do you think the French put a priority on this place over their fishing industry as they seek to exploit every opportunity to get access into the UK's waters? That is the priority for your European comrades uh, that you are seeking to have greater allegiance to. They will always give precedence and priority to their people, as opposed to what we have to do from all perspectives, which is to represent our people. When we think about what we are talking about in the protocol, tariffs, increased paperwork around regulations and declarations and imports, the regulatory checks on agri-food, manufacturing being subject to certification and inspections. We go down to the fisheries aspect that the Joint Committee uh, may well uh, be able to subject that to rules and EU uh, custom declarations. The agricultural support, the Joint Committee again holding the power to set upper limits on farm subsidies that would be in line with CAP. We think about the state aid issues as well. The magnitude of this is not something that should be something glibly just commented on by members opposite. Whenever you consider £355 million at this stage being announced for a trader supporter scheme funded by the UK government, that should crystallise the magnitude of what it is that we are talking about. But the members opposite, supported by the Nationalist Alliance Party, continue to prioritise their political ideology over the reality of the implications upon our business community and our consumers. And when it comes to the internal market, what business or the internal market uh, uh, bill, what business organization has said they're opposed to it? They, they may not like the tactics that have been deployed, but when it comes to the substance of the bill, 
Give me a business representative organization that has said they don't like the substance of it. May not like, have liked the tactics, but I haven't heard them saying we don't actually agree with removing the potential of barriers. Uh, and so it's important that we deal with this and we deal with it effectively. I want access to both markets. I want access to our great uh, Britain market and I want access to the European market. But the members opposite, supported by the Alliance Party, put precedence over the EU single market at whatever costs and whatever circumstances, because that's what you voted on yesterday. And when members talk about consent and the Good Friday Agreement, they didn't worry yesterday that not a single unionist voted for their motion. No, we'll continue to ride roughshod over the concerns of the unionist community and their representatives. And that's something that we will oppose. I'll give way. For giving way, and he talks about access to markets. Would the member agree that on the issue of free ports, for example, you know, we should be seizing the opportunities that the likes of that can bring, especially to the likes of the foil port within my own constituency? The, the, the member makes a valid point. The UK government have said that one of their objectives is to have uh, special circumstances for free ports to, to maximise economic opportunities. But state aid rules would have implications for that. And of course, the predatory neighbour when it comes to commercial activities in the Republic of Ireland, because that's what they are in terms of their cor corporation tax, in terms of the way they go after our airports with Dublin Airport, and when it would come to ports, Warren Point, Foy, Belfast, nothing stopping the Republic of Ireland using European institutions to frustrate those economic opportunities. But that's more important for the members opposite and the Alliance Party. We need to represent our people and act in their interests. And the, the Belfast Agreement, for whatever it's worth to the members opposite, spoke about respecting the integrity of the United Kingdom for as long as a majority of the people of Northern Ireland want to. The withdrawal agreement and the protocol breach it, but the members opposite and the Alliance Party couldn't care less. I oppose the motion. I call Martina Anderson. Tommy Kanchi Favor and Ryan Shaw. I speak in favour of this motion. The British government, without doubt, should withdraw the Internal Market Bill immediately and retract from the threat of replicating similar provisions in future legislation. The Bill does undermine the Irish Protocol, amends the 1998 Act, the legislative outworking of the Good Friday Agreement, and it is an attack on our power-sharing arrangements. These are the provisions that override the Protocol, attempt to block judicial refuse, and erode international and domestic law there is a clear attempt in this bill to give priority to the British internal market over the future priorities of our power sharing administration. This could have a particularly severe impact on the work here to advance equality, human rights and the environmental protections. The dreams of future generations cannot be crushed by an imp imposition of a Tory nightmare vision of the internal market. Provisions of the internal market risks undermining the human rights and equality protections in the Irish Protocol, which states that there would be no diminution of rights, and therefore the Equality Commission, the Human Rights Commission, the Irish Equality and Human Rights Commission should use their powers under the Protocol to raise concerns with the Specialised Committee. We need to hear a clear message from the Commissions, and we need to hear it this week. They need to stand up for equality and human rights and use their powers that they have to maximum effect. Now is not the time to cross your fingers and hope that things won't happen. Now is not the time for silence. We warn the NIO not to undermine the significant role that these commissions have under the Irish Protocol. These commissions need to be effective and robust. So the NIO must not decimate institutions that are central to the Good Friday Agreement. The British government will not impose their cold house vision for rights and equality here. There is an urgent need to hardwire additional guarantees, those unequivocal commitments that were made on the European Convention on Human Rights into the future relationship agreement currently being negotiated between the British Government and the EU. The political declaration refers to both the European Convention of Human Rights and the Good Friday Agreement. We simply, the world simply, 
does not trust the British government, given what we know of its current threats to the Human Rights Convention. The common travel area promises are still not adequately reflected in law, policy or practice. Many are going to discover that these guarantees and the guarantees given are meaningless in practice. We want to see the damage limitation guarantees implemented. The Irish Protocol needs to be protected and it needs to be protected in full. The shameful attack by the British government has rightly been condemned around the world. It's even been condemned within its own party. But it does raise an additional question. We have another option. We certainly do have another option. And Sinn Féin invites all those parties who are committed to the return of the North to the EU to discuss, to discuss the scope for the development of an agreed position. Sinn Féin endorses the recent proposals from the Constitutional Conversation Group. Sinn Féin would welcome the opportunity to discuss common ground with others. We need to engage with each other on how we're going to share this island differently in the future. Gormi Thank you. Gormi thank you. I'll call Steve Egan. Uh, indeed. Uh, Mr. Principal Speaker, and may I thank my friend from South Belfast and indeed my friend from the Finance Committee for bringing this motion forward, though unfortunately we will not be supporting this motion. And the reason we will not be supporting this motion is because we have a fundamental issue today that is being discussed 100 days out in London between Mr. Gove and Mr. Barnier. And the discussion is an informal discussion about how we are going to resolve the problems we are at at the moment. And I think for many people, we have listened to the sterility of this debate over a considerable period of time, when to many ears of this side of the House and indeed outside amongst my constituency, it sounds like Boris bashing turns into Brit bashing. And that is not something that I think is conducive or helpful for the people of Northern <coughs> Ireland, and particularly the consumers of Northern Ireland, who are going to be faced with some really significant choices to deal with in a very short period of time. So, Mr. Principal Speaker, and indeed, to the members of this Assembly, and indeed to the political parties of this Assembly, I have a proposal. The Ulster Unionist Party has a proposal that we write as an Assembly to both Mr Gove and Mr. Mr Barnier and say to them that we have real significant concerns about Northern Ireland being used as a political football. We have 100 days before we have to be, have in position things that are going to stop our goods being stopped coming across from our own country. We are going to have to be in a position where we are going to have to understand what the implications of state aid rules are going to be. We need to understand what the role of the European Court of Justice is going to be, because that will be a fundamental issue that we have to do. So I think, Mr Principal Speaker, what we should be doing as an Assembly and what we can do through the chairs of all the committees, and as chair of the Finance Committee here, I make this obligation that we will ask the committee tomorrow on this issue, is that we come together as chairs and through you, and we write to both the Executive Office, the First and Deputy First Ministers, and also, very clearly, we will write to Mr Gove and Mr Barnier and say, please stop using Northern Ireland as a political football. You have said right from the beginning the most single important thing is the Belfast Agreement. The single most important thing is about maintaining peace and security in Northern Ireland. And the best way to achieve that is to remove uncertainty. The best way to achieve that is so that our traders and our businesses and our companies are able to agree to understand what is going to happen on the 1st of January next year. That Mr. Principal Speaker, is what we as an Assembly should be debating, because the Executive Office aren't bringing those things to us. We should be the ones who are now saying to everybody in the United Kingdom, in Europe, in the rest of the world, stop using Northern Ireland as a political football. Let's do what's appropriate and do what's right for the people of Northern Ireland. Can any person in this Assembly say that we are going to be better off on the 1st of January next year? No. Can anybody in this Assembly tell me 
what is going to impact in our Tesco's and Asda's and everywhere else to the shopping basket for the consumer in Northern Ireland, who are all our voters, by the way. Can anybody tell me what that is going to be like? No. Can anybody actually tell me, just one second, can anybody actually tell me what the European Union and the United Kingdom have agreed in the Specialist Committee or the Joint Committee? Have we seen any output from these? Do we have any understanding of what it means to us? And yet we are 100 days out. But nobody seems to be taking any attention to that. But I think we, as an Assembly, with all the MLAs here, we should, through our committee structure, because nobody else is doing anything, we should be putting that through. And thank you for bringing the note to bring it towards this Assembly. But there is something more fundamental here. We can tilt at windmills as much as we like. We know the withdrawal agreement, or we both know the withdrawal agreement and the so-called internal market bill is, are both deeply flawed. But who is going to stand up for the people of Northern Ireland if it isn't us? That's what we were elected to do. We're not standing up for the people of Brussels. We're not standing up for the people of London. We should be standing up for the people of Northern Ireland. Mr. Principal Speaker, I've made a proposal, and I look forward to hearing from the rest of the committee chairs later. Thank you. And Mr. Speaker, will be fine in the future. Thank you. And I'll call Steve. I'll call Stuart Dixon. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, yeah, it is a bit of déjà vu, but this is actually a slightly different debate today. It is a debate with regards to the internal market bill, and it contains a, a series of provisions on the functioning of the internal market uh, within the United Kingdom, which, of course, um, uh, already had a part of the EU. There are issues with this, including the obvious and the likely dominance of England in comparison to the other nations, as well as the impact on the devolved settlements. Realise that the Scottish and Welsh governments both rejected the internal market white paper following its publication due to such concerns. It is dis dis disappointing, therefore, uh, that it appears that there was no formal response uh, compiled by the executive here in Northern Ireland. But for today, we will focus on how uh, now progressing the internal market bill interacts with the Northern Ireland Protocol and the arrangements to avoid a hard border with the Republic. I said it yesterday, and I will be clear again. The protocol is not perfect arrangement. The original backstop was a much better deal for Northern Ireland, and the protocol is a no, I want to finish. Thanks. The, the, the protocol is a compromise of a compromise. It is an arrangement to negate some of the problems that, unfortunately, Brexit brings to Northern Ireland, and we know who all brought Brexit to, to Northern Ireland. Um, the, Speaker, it is a matter of deep concern that legislation is being progressed in our national parliament that undermines an international agreement signed less than a year ago and adds further unease about the future of businesses and people in Northern Ireland. And on that point, I agree with Mr Aiken. It is, it is totally, no, I want to continue. It is, it is totally uh, disconcerting for businesses and for people who are in employment in Northern Ireland that we are being taken down this route. Upholding international law is a sign of a responsible actor on a world stage. There is a certain amount, indeed a great deal of irony, that the government instructs others to follow the law and yet blatantly sets out to break the law itself, followed sadly by a number of members of Parliament in Northern Ireland. Again, it is hard to work out what the government is doing here. The reality is that within the power of the United Kingdom government to prevent barriers and friction by striking a comprehensive trade deal. If these issues were so fundamental to the Good Friday Agreement, why did the Prime Minister agree to these terms and then run a general election campaign on them? Even if this negotiating tactic, even if this is a negotiating tactic, it undermines the UK's international reputation and credibility, and thus our ability to strike further trade deals. We heard yesterday, and it's worth repeating again today, uh, American politicians from both sides of the houses uh, in, in the US uh, would be very concerned and have made it very clear that it compromises any chance of a US-UK trade deal. At this rate, it seems that the UK will have no trade deals on the table, not even one with the EU. No trade deal with the US. Of course, it is to be welcomed that they have uh, sealed one with Japan. 
But then why bother? Because they already had exactly the same deal with Japan through their membership of the EU. How will anyone benefit from the UK having next to no preferential trade partners? It seems all the lofty aspirations of Brexit have evaporated, and we are left with a gloomy, complex and uncertain future. That cannot be good for business, and it cannot be good for employees. With piles of red tape and increasing barriers to business and to people's lives. Whether it is, as Mr Aiken says, our concern about the cost of uh, the price of a bag of sugar in the shops in Northern Ireland, or whether it is that they turn the south of England into a lorry park, all of those are very serious issues. We don't want borders, and we do not want checks anywhere. But if a hard border happens, then compromise must be made. That's where the protocol comes, as it's the basic structure to prevent a hard border with the Republic of Ireland. The UK Government should and must uphold its word to protect Northern Ireland from the harmful impacts of, of Brexit. Ministers here must ensure that the protocol is implemented before at the end of this year. Finally, Mr Speaker, I'd like to thank Mr Given for being a cheerleader for the Alliance Party, because every time he mentions our name, I can hear the cheers rising amongst all of those people who voted for Naomi Long and smashed it when we elected her to the European Union. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call Gary Middleton. Uh, th thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, the, uh, the Internal Market Bill is a step forward. It's a recognition by the UK government that there were defects with the Northern Ireland Protocol and the potential impact that the protocol would have on the internal market of the United Kingdom. But of course, more work is required. We are focused on ensuring consumer choice and costs are not impeded as a result of the Northern Ireland Protocol. It is important that goods arriving here in Northern Ireland are not subject to unnecessary checks, which in turn will lead to increased costs and reduce choice for consumers. It is vital that Northern Ireland businesses have unfettered access to the GB market, which is, of course, so important to Northern Ireland that it is welcome that the Internal Market Bill sets out potential helpful steps in this respect. With Northern Ireland's competitors able to support their emerging sectors through government aid, it would be wrong and it would place Northern Ireland firms at a clear disadvantage if we were restrained in a state aid straitjacket, unlike the rest of the UK. I will not. The UK government has stated that through the Internal Market Bill, they are delivering on the commitments made to provide unfettered access between Northern Ireland and Great Britain and to maintain and strengthen the integrity and the smooth operation of our internal market. We have all signed up to the New Decade New Approach Agreement to restore this assembly. The commitment in that New Decade uh, new approach states, to address the issues raised by the parties, we will legislate to guarantee unfettered access for Northern Ireland's businesses to the whole of the UK, uh, the whole of the UK internal market, and ensure that this legislation is in force for January 2021. We must ensure that we protect the £8 billion worth of goods uh, and sales from Northern Ireland to GB and guarantee our place within the UK's internal market. These are not new commitments. The DUP have been consistent at all levels, uh, including at Westminster, where a lot of this really matters. We need certainty. We need legal certainty and clarity for businesses in Northern Ireland, whose largest market is with the rest of the United Kingdom. In relation to some of the specifics in the Bill for Northern Ireland, Clause 40 places an obligation on the UK Government and devolved administrations to consider Northern Ireland's place in the UK internal market when implementing the protocol. That applies to trade between GB and Northern Ireland in both directions. Mr Speaker, Clause 42 gives UK ministers the power to disapply or modify, modify exit summary declarations for goods moving NA to GB. The government again yesterday made clear that the declarations would be disapply, disapplied through this clause would be those which do not recognise or respect the fact that Northern Ireland is part of the customs territory of the United Kingdom. The government talks about a safety net. I think it is reasonable, it is a reasonable description to talk about a safety net, given the fact that these issues cannot be resolved through the Joint Committee, then there absolutely needs to be a safety net in place. That's what any responsible sovereign government would do. 
My party colleagues at Westminster yesterday clearly articulated our position uh, in regards to the bill and indeed the amendments that were tabled in our name. The Government have indicated that many of these issues will be addressed through the Finance Bill. We, of course, will wait to see what happens in that respect. In closing, Mr Speaker, uh, we will not be supporting this motion. I think that our views have been well rehearsed. Uh, I note that uh, you know, the, the members opposite are, are continuing to table these motions. Uh, they are more than entitled to do so. But what I would urge them is to respect the fact that uh, many business, uh, businesses out there at this minute in time are struggling in, in a wide range of areas. And I think that we should be mindful that whilst it's great that certain members want to have their voices heard uh, in this chamber, I think that the focus should be on ensuring that the United Kingdom internal market is protected and that the businesses are properly heard through the relevant channels. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I call Sean Lynch. Uh, good, uh, Ken Collier. Just when we thought this issue of Brexit was sorted, um, within the withdrawal agreement and the protocol, the British Government announces it's going to break what was an agreement only made last January. Their announcement to break international law is not surprising, although this time they did it publicly. As a result, we are in the midst of another British-inspired Brexit crisis. The Good Friday Agreement is under threat. The fragile economy of the North is at risk, and we are facing a real possibility of a crash-out from the European Union. The paragraph clearly outlined in the Internal Markets Bill gives authority to the British Minister to directly impinge on the workings of this Assembly and to ignore the protocol in the withdrawal agreement. The protocol stated that nothing is to enter or be on sale here unless it meets EU standards, even if it comes from Britain. However, Section 45 gives the British Secretary of State the power to ignore any EU requirements for goods coming here. Like many of you, I have talked to many businesses, their representatives and individuals about Brexit, particularly in my own constituency, and there is no clamour from customers here to see the lowering of EU standards. In relation to the Good Friday Agreement, Strand 2, all Ireland areas of cooperation, like public health and environmental standards, are not grounds for exceptions. Under the British Government's Internal Markets Bill, ministers of the British Government will be empowered to breach elements of the Good Friday Agreement and the Withdrawal Agreement. The British Government has once again shown contempt for this part of Ireland, indeed for all the people of this country who voted and ratified the peace agreement. What they are doing by bringing this bill forward is to suit their own domestic political agenda. These are the same people that supported, campaigned for and financed Brexit. To say they are protecting the Good Friday Agreement could not be further from the truth. With British ministers like Michael Gove viewing, viewing the Good Friday Agreement as wicked, it is little wonder that Britain, as a co-guarantor of the Good Friday Agreement, can breach it and boast about it at the same time. The reality is that Tory governments have been undermining the Good Friday Agreement since they entered power in 2011. Therefore, to argue that the Internal Markets Bill is to protect the agreement is nonsense. Despite what members in the opposite say, there was never a good Brexit. It must be remembered that the majority of people in this part of Ireland voted against it. The protocol is not perfect, but it mitigates from the worst aspects of Brexit. Brexit itself is the problem. The people in the North want certainty, and I know the people opposite have said the same. They need clarity as well. They want to know their families and jobs will be safe next year. Their priority is to avoid any border on the Isle of Ireland, protect the peace process, Good Friday Agreement and the All-Ireland Economy. We in Sinn Féin will defend these as we have done in the last four years, fine, I won't, and work with those who share those priorities in the Assembly, Doyle, in Europe and the United States Congress. In addition, stand firmly against the British Government intention to tear up what was an international agreement. I support the motion. Thank you. And I call William Humphrey. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, and, uh, here we are, Act 2, Take 2 uh, of this, this drama. It is very clear Mr. Speaker, that the Northern Ireland Protocol is not good for Northern Ireland P's, PLC. And the Democratic Unionist Party at Westminster opposed and consistently voted against this legislation. We warned Her Majesty's Government and now we recognise and are glad to see that their 
accepting the pitfalls and the, the, the defects that there are within those protocols. The, the internal market bill is a step forward, but it isn't perfect. Yesterday, in this House, during Act 1 of this drama, we heard many parties across the way were concerned about a hard border. Those who were claiming it was going to be a hard border wouldn't give way to those of us who were challenging who was going to make it a hard border. The only person talking about this border on this island of Ireland, the frontier between Northern Ireland and the Irish Republic, was the former Prime Minister of the Irish Republic. When he claimed uh, at the World Economic Forum last year that he could see customs returning, uniformed people, police and army potentially returning to the Irish border. No one in the United Kingdom government or the Northern Ireland executive or in this House wants to see a hard border. So let's nail that. That is just a nonsense. And then we also have the situation from the Sinn Féin benches that the peace process is being undermined potentially. By whom is it being undermined? Who? I'll give away to those who want to tell me who by whom. The reality is that the Belfast Agreement, but you're going to undermine it. Go ahead. Very grateful to my colleague in the Public Accounts Committee for giving away. Just as a point of information, he said no one in the UK government had ever said anything about a hard border. He recognised that in early 2016, during the referendum campaign, numerous governments, numerous members of the UK government, including the subsequent uh, Prime Minister, then Home Secretary Theresa May, said there was no way the UK could leave the European Union in a specific way without there being the recreation of border posts. And Member has an additional minute. That's why my party rejected her proposals. And where is she now? And the, real, the reality is, <laughs> you, you, can, you can sit in the SDLP, that great golden cow of the Belfast Agreement, that your party sets up there that is absolutely untouchable and must not damage the Belfast Agreement. But the SDLP leader in the House of Commons in January of this year talked about joint authority. We'll not go back to direct rule. Such was his arrogance. We'll have joint authority. Now, you voted. I didn't. But your party voted and supported the Belfast Agreement. The principle of consent is absolutely enshrined in that agreement. Where is the consent for joint authority? I'll give way if you tell me whether the SDLP gets the consent of the Unionist people for joint authority. I'm grateful to him for proactively giving way. We're not debating uh, the, that statement today. We're debating the motion that's before us. Uh, but let me say absolutely clearly, the principle of consent is absolutely at the heart of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement and we support it, and that's what this motion is about today. You're contradicting and, uh, no. and not on the no. same page as your party leader. Indeed, yesterday we even had the potato famine in vote as, as, as a great wrong to Ireland. Of course it was. But we're in 2020. And the, and the reality is, let's be clear, anything which hinders or impedes Northern Ireland PLC in terms of trade from Northern Ireland to GB and in return is not good for Northern Ireland business. As Mr. Given said earlier, Northern, Northern Ireland business organisations are not on the same page as the parties across the way. I understand nationalists and republicans supporting the protocol because they want to destroy and end the union. They can't cost the United Ireland, the utopian United Ireland that they talk about. They can't cost it. None of them can. Never been able to do it. You can't. Simply can't because it's impossible. So the reality is. We want to see, we stand for, for free movement and free trade. We want to see the free movement of goods across the North Channel and the Irish Sea. Northern Ireland businesses must be given unfettered access to our largest market in Great Britain. And the bill is helpful in this regard. It is not the panacea, but it is helpful. Northern Ireland parties need to decide on this basis. Do you want what is best for Northern Ireland? Do you want what is best for the Northern Ireland people and for Northern Ireland business, your constituents and mine, or do you want to disadvantage permanently Northern Ireland business? The withdrawal agreement is bad for Northern Ireland economically, but it's also bad for Northern Ireland constitutionally. You may welcome that. But the fact of the matter is I hear much talk about the damage to international, to the United Kingdom and international law. What about the damage to the free movements of people, the free movement of trade? The equality of rights for those people that came from the Acts of Union of 1707 and 1800. What about those? Because when you're Brit bashing, and on that basis I agree with Mr. Aiken, 
and attacking the Prime Minister. Let me make it very clear when I'm, I've given way to you twice, I'm not giving way to you again, so don't think about it. When you're, when you're bit bashing, the reality is that the people of Northern Ireland, the vast majority of Northern Ireland, want to remain part of the United Kingdom. It's your job to convince them, including economic unionists. You're not able to do that because you can't. And, and so the, the truth of the matter is, as we move forward, I want to see business in Northern Ireland protected. I want to see the union protected. The union of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. That is where success and from everything flows for Northern Ireland. Members, this time protocol is, is not perfect, <coughs> but this, this bill that's going through the House will improve it. Members, time Nothing is up. Perfect, but will improve it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I oppose the motion. Thank you. And I call Pat Sheehan. Uh, I've got a and I welcome the opportunity to speak in this debate today. Um, the uh, Internal Market Bill is a full frontal assault on the Good Friday Agreement. I don't think there's any doubt about that. But the actual problem is Brexit. And when the members opposite were campaigning and supporting with gusto the campaign to leave the European Union, uh, maybe they didn't have the foresight to see what the repercussions were going to be. And that Brexit was going to undermine the Good Friday Agreement. There's no doubt about that. And we had the protocol as a, a, a far from perfect solution to the problems that Brexit was going to create for the Good Friday Agreement. But now we've had the internal uh, market bill. And, you know, everybody believes the internal market bill undermines the Good Friday Agreement. Uh, even the British government understand that. Uh, but of course, they say other ways. They actually turn things on its head and say the internal market bill protects the Good Friday Agreement. This is a government that would tell us black is white, that night is day. They're a bunch of unvarnished liars. And who do they send to the United States to convince Americans there that the, the IM bill actually protects the Good Friday Agreement. Dominic Robb. Dominic Robb was the man who appeared in front of the NI Affairs Committee and admitted to Sylvia Herman that he hadn't even read the Good Friday Agreement. He sent out as some sort of expert to explain to Americans. Luckily enough, the Americans are a bit more learned than Dominic Robb. They understand the repercussions of the internal market bill the Friday Agreement. So I would say this to unionists. Try and break away from the Stockholm Syndrome that you are all caught up in. It's a, it's a sad sight to see once proud unionists like Gregory Campbell and Sammy Wilson on their hands and knees, with their ears down and their tails between their legs, licking the boots of people like Johnston and Cummings. Cummings, who said, and I quote, I don't care if Northern Ireland falls into the effing sea. That's the man that you are dealing with. That's the man that you are cowtowing to. Why don't you? Could I ask the member, could, just, could the member just resume his seat for a moment? Could I ask all members just to keep the debate on a temperate level? I don't want us to descend any further. Thank you. Uh, certainly, I'd, I'd try to be as temperate as possible. But I think there is a, a, a fundamental issue here that uh, the English Tories don't care about here. And that's reflected in what Dominic Cummings said. And it's reflected in the jingoistic English nationalism, which has driven the whole Brexit debate. And I say, I say this genuinely and honestly to unionists. The English Tories will never consider you as their equal. Never. And I say to you, as a friend and a fellow countryman, to join, to join with us the ground is shifting onto your feet. Join with us to build a new country, 
a country of equals where we all share the same rights and the same freedoms. Let's join together. Let's forget about the unvarnished liars and let's forget about the other people who yank your tails. Let's, let's all of us together build a country where we can all live as equals. Thank you. And I call Sinead McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The British government has a long history of treating people with contempt, and you wouldn't have to look too far to see examples of this. My friends in the DUP can affirm this. Indeed, in my own city of Derry, we suffered greatly due to the wrongdoing of the British government. But we had hoped the British government had moved away from that shameful past. And it's very clear during the negotiations with the European Union that the British government has once again reverted to the bad old days of treating nations, treating neighbours and treating friends with complete and utter contempt. The Prime Minister has already showed that contempt in the way he played with the truth during the Brexit referendum. Now he is going further by rejecting the withdrawal agreement protocol that he himself signed up to and negotiated just a few months back. By doing this, he has shown contempt for the EU, he has shown for contempt for the citizens of the UK, contempt for the rule of law, and he has shown utter contempt and disregard for every single person in Northern Ireland. Do not be fooled by the further lies that are being peddled. Actions have consequences, and the protocol, as, as signed, is the consequences of the UK voting to leave the EU and to reject the single market and the customs union. Make no mistake, it is the UK that has put a border in the Irish Sea. It is not the EU. Mr Speaker, but more than this, Boris Johnson and his government is showing absolute contempt for this Assembly, to the Scottish Parliament and to the Welsh Parliament. The Internal Market Bill is a naked power grab by this power-hungry, right-wing, English nationalist government. Our powers as an Assembly will be badly cut by this bill. No wonder Nicola Sturgeon said that referred to it as a full-front assault on devolution. Boris Johnson and his inner cabal want that power to himself, to have the most centralised UK government that there has ever been in London for decades. He wants to limit the powers to govern Northern Ireland. And that should make every single person in this Assembly angry. Under this bill, any legislation that we pass that impedes the internal market will have no effect. I'll say that again. Any legislation that we pass in this Assembly will have no effect. So that means that if we want to protect our health and well-being of farmers' livestock, we may not be able to do it. If we want to eliminate zero-hour contracts, we may not be able to do it. If, what happens if we confirm a policy of no fracking and one of the other nations says fracking is OK? The Welsh Government is even concerned that in future its building regulations could be effectively replaced by those in England. Mr Speaker, regulations sits at the heart of this Assembly. Without our ability to regulate, this Assembly becomes, more, becomes little more than a talking shop. Boris Johnson is ripping up the devolution settlement. It is the old colonial way and attitude. If they don't like it, punish them. We want more powers. The response from Westminster is to give us less. You can see the same in Whitehall. The senior civil servants give government advice. They don't like it, so they get sacked and are replaced by yes men. And predominantly, yes, they are men. So just as we hoped we were making progress, progress, we find ourselves going backwards, slapped down by this government that wants to exert as much control as possible. Mr Speaker, I ask this chamber to support this motion and I would ask the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister to make clear of our rejection of the Eternal Market Bill. This executive needs to take a formal position opposing this bill. 
We know the government intends to ignore us if we refuse to approve legislative consent motion. That is just one more illustration of their contempt, both for this Assembly and for the people of Northern Ireland, of every tradition and of none. Thank you. And I call Roy Beggs. I, I too rise to oppose this motion, and I would reiterate the point made by my colleague Steve Bacon. We are 100 days away, and motions which do not garner support from all sides will be ignored. And we need to get a reality check on that. Um, a particular issue in the motion which, which irks me, there's a part of it which rejects any argument that the bill is necessary to protect the Good Friday Agreement. There has to be a recognition that the Northern Ireland Protocol drove a coach and horses through the Belfast Agreement. And I'll quote from the Constitutional Issues section uh, 1.3. The present wish of majority of people in Northern Ireland to freely exercise and legitimate is to remain to maintain the Union and accordingly that Northern Ireland status as part of the United Kingdom reflects and rely upon that wish. And it would be wrong to make any change in the status of Northern Ireland save with the consent of the majority of its people. And it goes on in Annex A, Part 1, Subsection 1. It is thereby declared that Northern Ireland and its entirety remains part of the United Kingdom and shall not cease to be so without the consent of the people of Northern Ireland. Voting in a poll, and then it goes on to explain how such a poll would happen. And why do I say that the protocol breaches uh, uh, the, the, the Belfast Agreement? It creates a border down the Irish Sea. It, it, it cuts us off from other parts of the United Kingdom. We will be governed not by the Assembly, not by Westminster, but many decisions will be taken out of our hands and determined by the Joint Committee and the Specialist Committee, arbitrated on at a European level. It significantly alters our constitutional position. There has been no recognition of that, not by the British government, not by the EU, not for others who claim to be guarantors of the Belfast Agreement. The Americans have taken a single-sided approach. The protocol breaches the Northern Ireland Agreement, and that needs to be uh, recognised if we're to have a solution. Going forward, we have to recognise that we don't reach an accommodation we are all going to be losers. All Northern Ireland consumers, all Northern Ireland workers, our businesses, and we're 100 days away. And what are we doing about it? We're continuing to throw brickbats and blame Brexit. Brexit is coming, whether you voted for it or against it, it's coming on the 1st of January. So we need solutions. And until we speak collectively together and move towards solutions, applying pressure to both sides, in our interests, they will ignore us and we will continue to be pawns. So that's why I agree with Steve Aiken. We collectively need to take action and speak to both sides, highlighting how this is damaging Northern Ireland, damaging the Belfast Agreement, and potentially damaging our consumers. The cost of importing goods will go up. The prices in our shops will go up. Delays will cause uh, jobs. Trade will be disrupted unless there is an agreement. So this is very, very urgent. And what are we doing about it? We're blaming one side or the other. We need to apply pressure to both sides to try and bring about a, a solution. It's not good enough to continue to uh, take a single-sided approach. Just to remind you on the trading aspect of things, some uh, 13.4 million billion pounds of our trade in uh, 2018 came from Great Britain and some 5.2 billion from the Republic and uh, the rest of the European uh, uh, community. So the, the danger of a border down the RIC is actually two, two and a half times more dangerous unless we get free trade flowing that way. It's not just about free trade flowing north-south, we need free trade flowing east-west. And if you're then to look at, at uh, our, our sales or exports, similarly, some 11 uh, uh, sorry, let me get my figures right. Some, some 6.7 billion pounds of our goods move to the Republic or to the, to the EU, but uh, a much, much larger amount, some 10.6 billion, moves to GB. So potentially a huge bearing in our exporters, on our jobs. We need free flow. 
I think of simple things like Asda, there's a distribution store in my constituency. And if goods arrive in and they were meant to have three days shelf life and they only have two, it gets dumped. It dumped. So the cost of transport goes up, the cost of goods goes up. We need solutions, we need to work together. And as soon as we get together and argue against the views being brought forward by the European Communion, uh, community and by the United Member Kingdom government, up. cutting us off and looking after ourselves, the better. I call Keeve Archibald. Um, Gura Mayogic, Karen Corlea, um, and I'm rising today to speak in support of this motion. Um, and firstly, let me say, it's not rehashing the Brexit debate to reiterate that the people of the North voted to reject Brexit. And they did so because the contradictions of Brexit and the relationships across our small island and these islands were apparent. In recognition of the unique and special circumstances of the North and the need to protect the Good Friday Agreement, the EU prioritised it in negotiations and the protocol was negotiated, painstakingly negotiated with the British Government over the course of three years. <clears throat> in recognition of the need to offer those protections to the all-island economy, north-south cooperation and the Good Friday Agreement. As was outlined by many speakers yesterday afternoon and again today, the protocol is a clumsy and imperfect tool and the best outcome to see it being able to operate in an efficient way is a comprehensive free trade agreement between the EU and the UK. As speakers also outlined yesterday, built in to the protocol are safeguarding and dispute resolution mechanisms. All efforts, best endeavours to use the term, should be focused on achieving an outcome that results in a free trade agreement. We here in the North have been through many negotiations. We know only too well they are difficult and complex. These particular negotiations have been going slowly, with little progress reported in key issues. But instead of applying themselves to resolve the issues within the process, the British Government decided to throw the toys out the pram and, like a petulant child, have a tantrum to get their own way. But this is no childish game. The stakes for our businesses, our economy, our communities and our peace agreements are much too high to be used as a pawn in negotiations by the British Government. This bill, as was highlighted at length yesterday, undermines the devolved institutions. It has been described as a power grab by the Scottish and Welsh governments also. It limits the ability of the Assembly to make regulations, and the three finance ministers for the North, Scotland and Wales have outlined their concerns about the powers that it gives to Westminster to bypass the devolved institutions in funding allocations. However, what has caused a great deal of concern in the international community is the freely admitted intent to break international law. The utterances of specific and limited mean nothing and wash with no one. It is a clear admittance that the British Government thinks nothing of breaking an agreement when the ink is hardly dry. The approach they have adopted is reckless. It's reckless for people and businesses here. But of course, Boris Johnson isn't worried about what new red tape and costs for his small business and if it'll be able to survive. David Frost isn't a young person hoping to study in the South and wondering if they'll still be able to afford fees. And Michael Gove doesn't have the hassle of applying for a settlement scheme permit to keep his family here, concerned about whether he'll still be able to cross the border. Those are the realities faced by people here. And what I care about is those realities. And what members in this chamber should care about is giving our businesses and communities certainty to plan for what is only 100 days away. What will unfettered access actually look like? What will the definition of at-risk goods be? What will the VAT regime be? What will SPS checks actually look like? And what are the labelling requirements? These are the types of practical questions that businesses desperately want answers to, and as yet they don't have them. I said in the debate yesterday the argument this bill was in any way designed to protect our peace agreement is absurd, and I say it again today, it's ridiculous. The protocol in the withdrawal agreement was negotiated to protect the Good Friday Agreement, to mitigate the contradictions of Brexit and the integrated arrangements across these islands. This bill seeks to undermine that with the flimsy excuse of giving certainty to businesses when we all know it's simply about the British government trying to have its cake and eat it and not live up to commitments it has made. This bill has caused havoc instead of providing certainty. It has muddied the waters further and created distrust when calm heads and rational thinking were what actually was needed. The reality is the clock is ticking down and time is running out to provide the much needed clarity and certainty before the end of this year. Our businesses and communities are already struggling with the impact of COVID-19. 
they will be devastated further if there is no trade agreement. As it is, the time frame for implementing any arrangements agreed is already far too short. All efforts are needed now by the British Government to ensure there is no cliff edge come the 31st of December. Thank you, and I call John Blair. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I rise to support the motion and also express my deep concerns over the UK government's threat to breach international law over the Northern Ireland Protocol. This suggests that the UK government has not yet come to terms with the implications of its choices and red lines on Brexit. It is claimed to be doing so on behalf of the people and the businesses of Northern Ireland to protect the, the, protect the Good Friday Agreement is risable. The framing of the Internal Market Bill is in fact at odds with the view of most people of Northern Ireland, the Irish Government of course, and as well the European Union. Northern Ireland, Mr Speaker, remains a divided society and contested space. The agreement brought a semblance of structure to manage these fault lines. The agreement was made easier, many believe, by already established relationships, including that of the UK and Ireland, both being members of the EU Customs Union and the single market. Twenty years on, and the situation in Northern Ireland remains delicate, and work to promote integration and reconciliation uh, continues. Essentially, Northern Ireland works best through interdependence, which includes. Yes, of course. Give way. Just in response to some of the points that have been made across the, the chamber, would you agree with me that both British and Irish citizens in Northern Ireland voted to remain, and that it is wrong to turn this into a narrow one identity versus another debate? The member has an additional minute. Uh, absolutely, Mr. Speaker. I thank the member for the intervention. Indeed, there was a branding of me done earlier, but, but I ignored it because it was incredible. Um, Democrats should, should accept my position as stated and, and not question it or brand me in that way. But in relation to, to the numbers involved and the support for the Belfast Agreement or against Brexit, we've heard a lot here today about the will of the people and the majority of the people. Well, anybody who spoke uh, about that should look back to the 2016 referendum and the 56 per cent of the vote. I was speaking there, Mr Speaker, about the, the um, interdependence, which includes the free flow of people and goods, both east-west and north-south. Any border drawn across the island, I will not give away so soon, no. Uh, the, any border drawn, Mr Speaker, across the island or down the RAC does bring emotional and political implications. However, in pragmatic terms, while east-west east -west trade is greater in value than north-south, there is more movement on the island than across the RAC, plus around 270 crossing points to consider versus seven in terms of the, the sea. Um, separate to that, any reneging of the terms of the protocol could see that co customs front, that customs frontier pushed back onto the island, with the pressure for checks as the EU naturally seeks to protect its economic integrity. Threatening to breach the withdrawal agreement already reached is self-defeating, both in the narrow terms that I have referenced, but also to the UK's ambitions to have a future relationship with the EU and a trade deal with the United States. Speaking as a member of the ERA Committee of this Assembly, Mr. Speaker, it is important for me to stress the agri-food sector's importance to the Northern Ireland economy, representing around 10 per cent of activity. That is considerably higher than the UK overall average, making the sector a much more important component of the regional economy than is the case for the UK as a whole. Furthermore, the profile of agriculture and associated industries also varies considerably across the UK. The Northern Ireland sector is built around quality rather than necessarily, necessarily scale. Standards really matter, and they are a matter of pride and priority to all stakeholders. Environmental, food safety, animal welfare and labour issues are now all critical considerations, with 100 days to go and the clock ticking. It is not a good time to start rewriting the rules and redrawing the boundaries. It is important, Mr Speaker, to, to also acknowledge the unique situation that Northern Ireland finds itself in around the implication of the protocol. This is, of course, the inevitable outworking of Brexit and, in particular, the decision taken by the UK Government and Parliament to rule out a softer Brexit based around the customs union and continued membership of the single market and the ongoing need to ensure an open border on the island of Ireland and protection of the Good Friday Agreement. Northern Ireland will consequently remain aligned to large aspects of EU regulation. 
the All Island context in terms of matters such as food safety and environmental considerations should be to all involved self-evident. It would be a strange thing, Mr. Speaker, if the Northern Ireland Assembly did not want to shape policy within its own area of competence, guided by my own belief in open and liberal international trade, but also, and more importantly, by many expert voices from our vital sectors. I support the motion and urge others to do likewise. Okay, thank you. And I call Dagla Magalier. Uh, thank you, Ancolia. And I want to commend the uh, proposers of this motion here before us today. Um, one of the things I want to just start off with, and during the course of the debate, uh, been quite, there has been some quite uh, interpreted language used around things like uh, Brit bicing forever, or, for example. Um, I don't think that that's not what this motion is intended for. Uh, this uh, proposal, this internal market bill that we're looking at, is probably one of the greatest acts of uh, internal self destruction I've ever, I've ever seen. And it has uh, caused uh, huge damage, if more damage can be caused to the international reputation of the British government. And that comes from within the British establishment. That's not coming from these benches. You know, we've already had Blair and Major and, and May, three former Prime Ministers, who expressed huge concerns about this, uh, Norman Lamont as well. We've had the House of Lords Constitutional Committee saying that it unravels the, the withdrawal agreement and, and brings the British government into conflict with international law. The USA, Nancy Pelosi, the representative, members of the uh, Ways and Means Committee, has expressed concern. Indeed, the, the Lord Chief Justice Declan Margaret has said that it's a flagrant disregard for the rule of law and undermines confidence in the legal system. So this isn't, you know, a Brit bashing thing where we're trying to get out the Brits. This, uh, this, this is has huge uh, implications over here, and it's quite right that we debate this here, because it could have huge implications for our businesses here, and uh, as a chair of the, the Agriculture and Rural Affairs Committee, I have a special uh, interest in that um, aspect of our society as well. But turning to the, uh, to the actual uh, legislation itself, there is a number of things that it's important to look at. Um, a number of the, the clauses, and I did take a look over the legislation earlier. Clause 42, for example, disapplies the, the uh, EU um, declaration exit procedures, uh, given commitment to um, no new checks on goods going from here to Britain. But it doesn't, it doesn't address the issue of unfettered access because it hasn't set out what is a qualifying good. So we don't know. Like we've, we imported 40, 41,000 cattle into the north here by August this year. We imported 350,000 pigs into the north. Would the products which come from them, is that, is that going to be qualifying goods? Will they, will they be able to go to the, the British market? And of course the internal market bill was to uh, aspire to have no exit declarations. It doesn't, it doesn't state that there will be no checks on, the, the, in fact there will be checks on what goods qualify, uh, for, are qualified and what don't qualify. The other thing is cl clause 43, the, the disapplication of state aid. That sounds good, so it does uh, to some people. But at the same time, whenever Britain leaves on the 1st of January, World Trade Organization rules will, will kick in. And the WTO uh, rules post transition is hugely different to the state aid rules that govern um, our subsidies and our payments here. For example, the WTO doesn't set any limits at all on uh, support for um, coupled and decoupled support uh, for, for uh, farming and agriculture. You know, so that will create a huge imbalance in the playing field for our producers here compared to across the water in Britain. And of course, Clause 45, as Sean Lynch said a while ago, overrides all of the other relevant laws. A couple of the other things I just want to draw attention to, just to uh, note it, was that Clause 48, Clause 48, just unilaterally, the British government has just completely unilaterally amended the NI Act, and that's written in, actually into the bill. It amends the NI Act in relation to um, what they, they term just distortive and harm, harmful subsidies. They tell us, they decide what so-called distortive and harmful subsidies are. So Mother England is telling us what's good and what's bad. We can make up our own minds. Clause 49 amends the NA Act as well. The entrenched amendment, it actually uh, restricts the executives and the Assembly's competence to actually modify aspects, aspects of the bill that could have implications here. So it's the, it's the pr protection of the Act against modification. So again, this completely and utterly uh, raised roughshod under our ability um, here to have any uh, input. And that, that, that NI Act was just unilaterally um, amended without any consultation or any recourse to this uh, devolved assembly. It undermines every single one of us. So in conclusion,
conclusion, it has been said, there, has, there is no good Brexit. Um, the best option for seamless trade east, west, north, south was to remain within the EU. Unfortunately, the democratic wishes of the people of North Air of Ireland were completely discarded and we didn't get that there. The backstop might have um, facilitated a freer flow of trade east, west. That was undermined by uh, the DUP, actually, uh, you know, um, um, in Westminster, whenever they were in uh, talk with the, the, uh, the Tory government. And now we've got the protocol. And now this internal uh, market bill has now added confusion on top of a huge level of uncertainty. So there is no, um, uh, there is no good Brexit, but the protocol is probably, at this stage, the, the least worth option to try and deal with a very, very complicated Never situation. So I support the bill. Thank you. And I call Patsy McGlone. Gorham Agat, Ken Corlea, Agus Gorham Safalja, Leish and Wallace Show, Agus and Gies Brach Leish. It was clear, even before the COVID-19 pandemic, that a trade deal between the UK and the European Union was critical in protecting the interests of everyone living in Northern Ireland. Securing an economic recovery from the impact of the pandemic would be difficult enough in the best of circumstances. The withdrawal agreement reached between the UK and the EU may not be the best of those circumstances, but it is the only circumstances both sides could agree on. The implementation of that agreement in full remains an obligation under international law. <clears throat> an obligation that the current British Government under Boris Johnson actively signed up to. Crucially, it addressed the prospect of chaos and uncertainty that would accompany a no-deal trade or no trade uh, deal between the EU and UK. And it was always recognised that a no-trade deal with the EU would cause chaos, particularly on the island of Ireland. And reference was made earlier to the issues of agri-food, and a number of speakers have, have referred to that and its crucial importance for our local economy and the free flow of those economies uh, and trade within the island of Ireland, which happens daily, in fact. Um, that is why it was necessary to include the Northern Ireland Protocol in the withdrawal agreement. That protocol was the balance and produce of long, difficult, detailed negotiations and represents a delicately balanced compromise by all sides. It was necessary because of the many complex and sensitive issues that Brexit raised for everyone living on the island of Ireland. The UK Internal Market Bill threatens to drive a coach and horses through that delicately balanced compromise. If the bill is implemented, it would seriously damage political trust between the EU and UK, and I should also add the USA, uh, who have uh, recently uh, made prominent politicians from the US have recently pronounced on where the UK is what. The, the difficulties that the direction of the UK taking at the moment is going to wind up. It threatens to unilaterally replace uh, that agreed approach with measures that would further erode the authority of this Assembly and the other devolved administrations. Its measures would create more difficulties for the agri-food sector on the island, damage our economy and undermine political stability. No doubt there are some who would look to profit politically from that instability, whatever the cost just as there would be those who would look to profit financially from the economic chaos and uncertainty of no trade deals with the EU. But the risk involved is why the UK's government is current approach to negotiations of such concern. And for all his bumbling public persona, Boris Johnson understands this perfectly well. He understands the well-found concerns of the Irish government and the parties in this assembly as well as those of the other devolved administrations. He understands the concerns of the EU regarding the difficulty of maintaining the single market in a no-deal scenario. It is one of the reasons he is threatening to tear up the protocol. It is, in effect, an attempt at extortion rather than negotiation. But even without the serious implications for everyone living on this island, there would rightly be concerns at the tactics of the British government. Text, tactics demonstrated by the introductions of provisions in the bill designed to break international law. That is why Boris Johnson faces a rebellion within his own party by those on both sides of the Brexit debate and criticism from former UK Attorney Generals. It is why the UK government, government's Advocate General in Scotland was unable to reconcile his obligations as law officer with the policy intentions with respect to the internal markets bill. And it is why advice has been given to civil servants in London about what to do if they are asked to work on a policy that breaches the civil service code, a code which makes it very clear that civil servants must comply with the law and uphold the administration of justice. 
It also, uh, John Corley, raises the question of whether support for the Internal Market Bill would breach the Northern Ireland Executive Ministerial Code of Conduct, which similarly requires executive ministers to support the rule of law unequivocally in word and deed. If we are to believe the British Government, they say they will seek the legislative consent of this Assembly for the implementation of the Bill. In those circumstances, I would expect, first of all, that the Executive seek legal advice on that question. And if they do not, perhaps the Speaker's Office and this Assembly should likewise seek advice. I know um, the issue of a plethora of statutory instruments being foisted through the ERA Committee. We have had to seek legal advice around that and the manner in which the Department seeks to pursue that. In the meantime, the First and Deputy First Minister should commit Ma the to opposing the legislative consent in this Assembly for the UK Internal Market Bill when or if that member consent is fought. Gormila Magath. And I call Rachel Woods, and the member has two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I don't, I don't have anything prepared for two minutes, but um, I will I'll try and get through this as much as possible. But as many in the chamber have explained, and will no doubt continue to do so, there is no such thing as a good Brexit for Northern Ireland. And this latest shambles surrounding the UK internal market bills on only seek to underline this. Her misleading claims and myths truths of ardent Brexiteers are beginning to unravel, while the future of Northern Ireland makes the front pages again and again, and we all scramble for the latest scrap of detail on the post-transition plans from Boris and from this executive. Nothing new then. Analysts consistently pointed out that the internal market white paper would not be workable in full for Northern Ireland unless the rest of the UK remains aligned with the EU regulations for goods. And given what the UK government says it wants to achieve, it's simply impossible to satisfy both the, market, the internal market and the protocol. But what is this executive doing? The minister is elected to represent businesses, livelihoods, families and the best interests of people here. In July, I tabled a priority written question to the First and Deputy First Minister to ask for their assessment of the impact of the UK Government's approach to the UK internal market in relation to the protocol and whether or not they even responded to the consultation on the White Paper, and I am yet to receive a response two months later. Judging by the moves in other devolved regions, the prior grab that is the internal market bill will be fiercely resisted. One just has to look at Scotland and the efforts of my Green Party colleagues there, and yet there is no strong collective voice standing up for the legislative competence of this Assembly and the principles of devolution. As the political pantomime over the internal market bill continues, livelihoods are being lost and the hope for Northern Ireland's post-transition future is fading. Post-Brexit trade deals will see the rich getting richer and the most disadvantaged suffer more. There is a perfect storm coming in Northern Ireland when it comes to food poverty, increased grocery costs, especially for those in rural communities that are reliant on small retailers, the impact of COVID, reduction in employment and the growing numbers in universal credit. It is time for the executive Remember to step up, up and represent the interests of those that elected them. Thank you. I call Colin. Point. Could I inquire, Mr Speaker, why... 11 speakers were called to support the motion and only five to oppose the motion, bearing in mind the exhortation of Standing Order 17.5 to reflect the balance of opinion. How is 11 to 5 plus the 12th speaker about to be called reflect the balance of opinion? The member will also be aware that uh, the speaking rights are through the hunt, by and large as everything is in this assembly and then within this institution. That's the guarantee of democratic rights of every single voter right there, so that their representation is proportionate. And uh, all of those members who had indicated to speak were on the list as of right. I can't determine how everyone's going to vote or how everyone's going to argue when they come in for a debate. So the, 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 the list, the speaking list today was designed, or rather it was agreed on the basis of the proportionality rule that we that govern. By and large, governs how we do our business in this chamber, and I have exercised uh, discretion in previous debates. There was no need for it here because you couldn't have actually exercised that throughout this entire debate this afternoon. So, all the members who spoke here today had a valid right to speak, and you would have been the next speaker had other members perhaps not taken the additional minute. But nevertheless, all members here were guaranteed. I can't guarantee how everybody's going to speak or how everybody's going to vote. So that's the decision. Okay, so. Who spoke declared whether they were speaking for or against. 17.5, not exclusively, 
but does refer to the desirability of a balance of opinion. How could there be a balance of opinion with 11 to 5? Well, as you say, they, they, they may have declared how they're going to vote when they begin to speak. Anyway, we're moving on. So all, the, all those who speak had a valid right to speak in the proportionality principle. And I'd like to stress again, I have in the in past occasions uh, called speakers, including yourself, Mr Alistair, to speak out of turn in the uh, chamber to, to ensure some type of balance. can't be exercised in every single vote. We do our best. All of the speakers do their best whenever they can do that. So I now call on Callum McGrath to conclude and wind on the debate. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and 12.5. I shall continue. Uh, I welcome the opportunity to speak on the motion before us here today and to wind on this debate. There can be no doubt that this entire process of Brexit, the, uh, of taking back control of English nationalism gone mad, has been an unmitigated disaster. Like the SDLP motion that called for an extension to the transition period in June, this debate is an essential opportunity for this Assembly to make our voice heard again. We were denied this opportunity for too long, and we are able to signal to the British Government that we do not agree with this internal market bill. Since the initial Brexit vote in 2016, we have seen three United Kingdom Prime Ministers, all from one Tory party, all with differing views on what Brexit really means. Brexit has rocked international relations and how the United Kingdom is viewed the world over. And all the while, the public here are wondering, what does this mean for us? Members in this chamber can say what they want, and many have already stated many times about the Brexit vote being a UK-wide one and that we must accept the will of the people. And I categorically say that I do. I accept the will of the people in my constituency of South Down, 67 per cent who voted overwhelmingly to remain. And I accept the will of the people across the North, the 56 per cent who voted in, remain, in favour of remain. And I accept that voice of the Good Friday Agreement, whose authors understood and appreciated our place within the European Union and all the assistance that the European family provided us, whether they were economic, social or cultural as we clawed our way out of so many troubled years and into a time of peace. What I will not accept, however, is the voice and will of a UK government that ran roughshod over their own MPs, their own ministers, their own prime ministers, because of one deal who negotiated another deal and then threw it out because they could, simply could not sell it to their own Brexiteers. I do not accept the Northern Ireland Secretary of State, who openly declares in the House of Parliament that his government will have to break international law, but just a bit. This is not all to say nothing, to say nothing of how abysmally they have treated the negotiating team within the European Union. Mr Speaker and fellow members of this Assembly, how can we ever trust the perpetrators of such a shameful abdication of responsibility? Because make no mistake, if this internal market bill passes at Westminster and SDLP MPs are working hard with others to try and prevent that from happening, it will confer pariah status on this Tory government. And in so doing, if this bill passes, the United Kingdom foolishly believe that they can tailor the Good Friday Agreement to suit their needs. There will be no US-UK trade bill. That is not open to discussion and that is not negotiable. I will highlight a few remarks that a number of members have made here as part of this debate today. We started the debate with my colleague Matthew O'Toole, and he referred, amongst other things, to the fact that we could potentially still be looking into the face of a no-deal scenario, and that that would be totally and wholly unadvantageous for us here. He began, and then many others made reference after, to the internationally reckless and diabolical approach that has been taken by this British government. And then asked a really key, critical question. Do we want to be plunged into an economic crisis whilst we are in the middle of the greatest pandemic to impact us in living memory? Is that really where we want to go? Go on ahead. Um, Last week at the Economy Committee, we heard from Richard Ramsey about how the economic crisis caused by COVID-19 could take to 2024 to recover from. That wasn't taken into account a no-deal outcome. 
So would the member agree with me? We, we really need to see a focus on achieving that? A free yeah. trade agreement, that is? <laughs> Uh, absolutely. I mean, COVID, we can't control in the sense that it is going to have the impact that it has, and that is going to be terrible for our economy. But there is some control that can be exercised over the Brexit outcome, and we've seen the British government try to opt for one of the worst possible outcomes for that, and that will have an even bigger uh, impact on us as well. And in talking of that British government, uh, Matthew made the point, the very valid point, is Boris Johnson somebody that we really want to trust with our future. Boris Johnson. Mr. I'm going to make moves. I'm over halfway through my time now. Paul uh, Gibbon highlighted how this feels like it's round two today after a similar debate yesterday. What, what, what's wrong with that? What's wrong about having a conversation every day about the biggest constitutional, economic, cultural and seismic change that there is going to be to these islands and the impact of everybody that lives on it? I think we would be neglecting our duty if we weren't actually talking about this every day. And I note also that we're having a debate on a ministerial, uh, we're not having a debate on a ministerial statement at any stage from the First Minister or the Deputy First Minister. For the second time today, I get to make the point that they must be in hiding because they can't agree on an approach. And you had said as well about which business group disagree with the content of the internal market bill. Well, what about this? How many of those um, business groups agree with Brexit? They were all pretty vocal in saying that Remain was the best way forward. Martina Anderson detailed the importance of the protocol and the protection of equality and rights, and they were underscored in the Good Friday Agreement. They are protected there, yet this internal market bill rides roughshod over the protections of previous internationally agreed agreements. And we need to see our com uh, commissions effectively challenge this potential attack and grab that there could be on our rights. Steve Aiken referred, uh, referenced uh, the Boris Johnson and the potential Brit bashing that there is. Yes? to the member for giving way. Would he agree with me? And can I set down in just absolute clear terms that not only are there many hundreds of thousands of British citizens in Northern Ireland who didn't support Brexit, but there are people across the island of Britain who utterly reject Boris Johnson's government and what he's doing. I speak as someone who until earlier this year lived in London, and it's all well and good, the member putting his head in his hands. I lived in London. My son was born there. I utterly reject and am offended by the suggestion that it's Brit bashing to oppose the conduct of Boris Johnson and his, the gov his government, which is damaging people across these islands. I, I thank the member. I totally agree with what he says and, and agree that it couldn't be further from the truth. We are interested in here, whether it was Johnson, whether it's May, whether it's Cameron or whoever, if they don't have the best interests of here, then we won't be supporting what it is that they're going to do. It also suggests that we write to Mr Gove and Mr Barnier, um, just to say my committee, the Executive Office, we did back in July, nearly 100 days ago, um, we're still waiting to get any reference and any reply from Mr Gove, so I'm not so sure that us writing will achieve anything, but if it's something that we can do that tries to impact and mitigate against the impact of Brexit, we will certainly be uh, agreeable to that. He also said a few... Very quickly, it down is. to two minutes. And may, and may I thank indeed the, may I thank the chair of the executive uh, uh, committee to do that as well. I am in the process of writing out to all the committee chairs now, but I think, bearing in mind we've only got 100 days left, I think it's something that we could be doing uh, very appropriately. But thank you. But just to say, you did mention a few times about it being 100 days away and that we are in peril and we, we need to move quickly. I'd have to say, that's why the STLP asked for an extension to the transition period. We wouldn't be stirring at 100 days. We potentially could be looking at a year plus 100 days if we had all supported that back then. I'm sorry, Mr Dixon, I'm not going to get to make references to what you had said because my time is moving on. But um, the people of the North voted to remain in Europe and in so doing reject Brexit. The SDLP has been steadfast in that view and our commitment to it. We are proud Europeans. We are uh, steadfast in our commitment to our place in Europe because we know that our relationship with Europe is a mutually beneficial one. We hold the Good Friday Agreement to be sacrosanct and so will vehemently oppose this UK internal market bill. So we call on the United Kingdom Prime Minister just for once for once to show some genuine leadership and respect the will of the people here 
to realise that the Brexit agenda that he is recklessly pursuing, regrettably one that is aided and abetted by some MPs from the North, uh, who in the run-up to the Brexit vote in 2016 agreed with the statement that said that we needed to get the ethnics out, that will not be good for anyone. Brexit will not be good for anyone, and it will be the worst of all for the people of the North of Ireland. Mr Speaker, I am proud to support my colleague Matthew O'Toole and support the motion that is before us today. Okay, members, the question is that the motion standing on the order paper be agreed. All those in favour say aye. Aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Thank you very much, members. Just members, just take a raise for a moment or two, please. <laughs>